Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to Building My Legacy Podcast. I'm with Kate Fitzsimmons again today, and we are going to continue our series in How Do We Build Resilience? Today, we're going to use the three R's to look at what do we do when we're comparing ourselves to other people? And hmm, sometimes we despair, feel a little disappointed (laughs) as we compare. So, Kate, I'll turn it over to you. Well, um, thank you as always, Lois, for having me on here. And a big hello to everyone else. Thank you uh, for joining us once again. I'm having so much fun um, doing this series, and I hope your listeners are enjoying listening along every bit as much. Um, So today I've chosen a topic which I guess is somewhat a little taboo or I guess awkward to talk about or something that we don't often really like to admit that we do, you know, because we all know that we kind of should, quote unquote, celebrate, you know, our colleagues or our co-workers or our friends' Mm -hmm. success, you know, being a good, noble person. Uh, But let's be honest, I think we can all think of a time when, you know, we've been working really, really hard at a pitch to win over a client and, you know, although yours was like well praised by your boss, you know, your colleague's idea ultimately gets selected and yours doesn't. And suddenly what felt like a bit of success just feels like you're suddenly now a complete failure compared to them. And you get that little bit of jealousy set in or, you know, you feel like you've worked really hard on your team's project all day. You made heaps of progress and then you find out your colleagues made even more and they're way further ahead and suddenly what seemed like a productive day seems like you got nowhere and once again you're feeling like a failure or even in today's so circumstances hard. yeah or um you know in today's circumstances with covid-19 uh you know maybe you were laid off your job for a bit and and your colleague isn't and you're like, well, why me? And you're like, I should be happy that they've kept their job, but you're feeling really miserable and like a complete failure that you're the one that's been laid off the company, Mm. right? So I think we can all relate to that insecurity a little. Have you felt that once or twice or many times, Lois, throughout your career? Oh, you do (laughs) feel it. Oh, yes. I I hate to admit it, but I have felt it. And you know, the hard thing is, Kate, when you feel it, you feel guilty. And you go, I always go to why was I not enough? You know, so you have all those emotions. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to feel them because you feel like it's wrong to have it because you should be in joy for this colleague, right? Yes, yes. And th- I love that you said that, because where I want to take this first is to help you understand why there's no reason to judge, no reason to feel guilty. And in fact, the fact that you have those feelings actually, again, healthy sign that you're a human being with a healthy brain. <laughs> okay. Um, and I want to just admit as well, I feel it a lot um, myself, you know, um, really as a speaker, I, it's a pretty competitive industry, right? And so you read, you know, someone else will post up their reviews or their feedback and you're like, oh, that sounds so much better than mine. I'm not I'm not enough. They're way better than I am. And rather than, you know, I should be celebrating and it's like, oh, it's great that they're doing so great, but that kind of means I'm not. <laughs> or, you know, maybe even just as something as simple as, you know, you've got that person you go to the gym with all the time and suddenly they start losing more weight than you and you're feeling, again, that you're not good enough. <laughs> they're, you know, you're like, I should be happy for them, but I'm really jealous that they're losing more than me. Like whatever the situation is. I feel like if you're a human being with a human brain, we've all struggled with this at one time or another. So, of course, as Lois mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to be using my three R's of recognizing, reflecting, and redirecting to help us explore how we can begin to separate other people's success from making it feel like we failed and genuinely really celebrate their achievements without making it mean anything negative about our own. But before I dive into that, 
you know, as I've done in a few episodes, I really love taking a moment to explain a few important features and functions of our um, of our of our brain and of our humanness, so we kind of understand what's going on, you know, quote unquote, beneath the hood, um, and and learning how we can work with our natural instincts and tendencies rather than constantly resisting and fighting against them and judging ourselves to them as if we're flawed for thinking or feeling that way, especially in regards to this whole their success is my failure mentality. It's actually really healthy and normal to have that initial instinct to compare and despair because our brain by design is meant to constantly kind of assess ourselves against other people to see how we're fitting in and where we sit in amongst our peers and who's better or who's worse and do we belong here and do people think I'm good enough and all of that mind chatter. Not because your brain actually thinks that you're worthless, but because back in our ancestors' day, when we weren't just waking up to turn on Netflix, pop some bread in the toaster and chill out on the couch, but when it was literally a game of survival where there was no guarantee when our next feed would be and whether we'd have shelter that night, we depended on fitting in and belonging to a tribe to survive. You know, facing a wild predator like a tiger or a snake on your own, more often than not would probably mean you're dead meat. But facing a tiger with a group who's able to help you spot it and hunt it and trap it and distract it away or run from it, like you've got a far better chance of surviving, right? So our brains begin to develop this mechanism of constantly wanting to seize up everyone around, like kind of size them up and always ask ourselves like, am I okay? Do I fit in here? Am I good enough to belong here? Because if not, you'd likely be rejected from the tribe because you were too slow or too loud or whatever it is. And if you were being left alone in the woods to defend for yourself, probably wasn't going to tell out, turn out well for you if you had to try and face a tiger or a bear, right, that you just simply can't defeat alone. So I believe seated deep within our subconscious is this fear, a normal human fear of we're not enough. and. What else do we know about our subconscious brain that I've shared? Uh, <laughs> Lois is a fan of it. Is that the, the, those thoughts are very automatic, right? The subconscious brain has quick automatic thoughts with negativity bias, which triggers what I call. Do you remember? Ants. Ants. That's it. Ants. So, ants, ants, ants. I can just feel them sometimes ants. crawling in my head. After yes, they're very talking. incessant and they get everywhere and they're quick. Yes. So yeah. it's really natural for those ants of I'm not enough to be triggered as soon as something happens, right? And I know it just feels like they just come over us, but they're always just sentences in our mind. So when you combine this kind of um, negativity bias and this kind of tendency to want to feel like we always belong to a tribe and that we're good enough, it kind of makes sense that by default, automatically, our brain wants to interpret someone else's success, someone else's, you know, better weight loss, better promotion, higher pay rise, more downloads on their podcast, whatever the success is. It makes sense that automatically our brain interprets that as like a threat and as evidence to prove true our belief that, hang on a minute, this could be dangerous. You could be rejected here. You could be misplaced because here's more proof that you're not enough. Remember, we have a confirmation bias that wants to prove our beliefs true. So automatically it's going to interpret it through the lens that you're not enough. You don't belong. You're not worthy of being human here. And if we go a layer deeper, although it's great to always be working and living together in a tribe because the ways that they can help protect you and source more food, Guess what else being in a tribe means? Sharing. It means when food is caught, you have to divide it up and share it amongst your people rather than having a whole fish, you know, rather than having the whole fish, you're only getting part of it. And in ancestors' times, you weren't exactly walking down the road to the grocery store to fill up your shopping trolley with all your favorite food. You literally had to like hunt for days on ends to find something to keep you alive. So food was scarce and it had to be divided up and shared. So the brain also began to develop a scarcity mindset of there's not enough, okay? And a default belief that if someone gets something, you get less and therefore it's a competition, right? So you're grateful for the tribe and you want to belong, but you also have to be careful because every bite they're taking is one less bite that you get. So watch out. 
you're not enough and there's not enough. There's not enough food, shelter, water, whatever it is. Make sure you don't let the others, you know, gain too much or get too far ahead or eat too much because then you won't get enough and you won't make it. So again, if you apply that to across to where we are today and the scenarios I've mentioned so far, you can kind of see how our deep fear that if someone else is successful is taking away from our ability to do so, right? It, we kind of have this idea of like it's food. Like if they get if like they get more success, we'll get less, less happiness, less of a future because they got quote unquote more than us. Okay, so now that we've kind of just explored that really deep kind of primitive embedded survival mindset that our uh, brain is functioning off, I'm just saying that so we understand it's all very healthy to initially kind of um, think that way because as you said instantly you mentioned the word guilt when you when we thought that so we, let's not layer our emotions let's not layer the jealousy with then you know judgment of ourselves let's just now recognize like okay that's normal and then use that first r to recognize what is the thought that we're often thinking in regards to someone else's success which what do you think your key thought is lois well, if it's what we're thinking, it's um, why was why was that I not good enough, right? So it's mm-hmm. back to the enough issue. What's yep. enough? What's not enough? Yeah, it's so true, right? It's suddenly I'm not enough. And I think it is the number one core fear that we all have in common. And I think it's uh, if we could dive beneath even the most, uh, I guess, unjust kind of behavior it would just come down to that person's fear Mm -hmm. of feeling that they're not enough okay but we just want to recognize oh that's the ant that's the not enough ant that's it it's just a sentence in your brain and there's doesn't make make you more or less of a human because you're thinking it it's just part of your humanness very natural for you to instantly have that thought okay so we don't want to freak out about it. We don't want to judge ourselves, but simply recognize it for what it is, an outdated sentence in your mind on autopilot. And then we're going to ju- go to the second R, which is reflect. That is it. So reflect upon the impact of those thoughts and are they useful? Okay. Because it's going to be tempting. Your brain's going to want to keep arguing and telling you, no, 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 you really are not enough. You really are a failure. And then think about how you then show up at work or in your team meetings or even in your personal relationships at home when you feel ashamed or jealous or insecure because you're thinking, I'm not enough, there must be something wrong with me. Like, do we feel like being our most productive and proactive and fun and engaged selves and feel like putting ourselves out there in conversations or, you know, working extra hard or making extra jokes or being really lighthearted? when we feel ashamed no or do we tend to more yeah we want to more likely like hide away at our desk right not speak up in the conversations as much overthink every single thing that we're writing and not go out for lunch with our (coughs) colleagues you know but uh more likely probably try and sit at our desks and just inhale a block of chocolate (laughs) or you know um, you know (laughs) or yeah like we want to it which is then kind of proves true this idea that we're not enough. See, how dare you go and eat a block of chocolate? Like you re- there really is something wrong with you. We act in ways that kind of perpetuate this belief and prove it true in our minds, okay? So that s- spiral kind of um, keeps going, you know, that self-fulfilling prophecy. So we're far more likely when we're feeling insecure and unworthy and embarrassed to act in ways um, of, you know, like binging, binge eating or procrastinating or hiding away from the world and ultimately going to prove that belief true, okay? So as tempting as it can be, if we want to build resilience and learn how to uh, break, th- break free from this natural instinct of just compare and despair, we need to recognize it's part of our humanness coming from our ants, but then see how... If we don't take responsibility for changing those ants, we're just going to keep perpetuating the cycle. But by stepping up and taking responsibility for that, that is, of course, when we had the third and final R of rather than just 
immediately believing and reacting to all these thoughts as if they're factually true and then acting in ways that proves that true, we can choose to watch Lois. Redirect. Yeah, that is it. Tan to that one. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You were ready. So uh, just redirect. Show your brain there are so many other ways and options and perspectives that we can focus on instead that are going to be far more useful and empowering thoughts that lessens the amount of self loathing and shame or jealousy that those initial ants might be causing. Okay, so because I think that's the number one thing we need to stop is just that judging ourselves for naturally feeling a sting of disappointment or jealousy. Expect that to be there. Plan on that to be there. Recognize it's just sentences in your mind. They're not helpful. So what else can we redirect to? So here's some of my favorite redirect thoughts when I feel that sting of rejection. When I look at my podcast stats and compared to someone else and I'm like, Oh, I'm not good enough and I wish they weren't quite so successful so I could be more successful is I remind myself success is not food. It's not in limited supply, guys. There is a limitless amount of success to be had in the world. Like someone's ability to do something well doesn't take away from how ability to do well. In fact, I want to offer you guys this. When it comes to career, like someone doing well in your workplace, someone doing well if you're working, you know, if you've just got your own small business and you see another small business in the same kind of industry doing well, that is actually a really good thing for you because people being successful at that thing grows demand for that industry, right? Like I want professional speakers to be really good because a company gets a speaker in they wow that company then next year two years three years later they're like oh we want to get another speaker in that was a great experience so guess what they go and do try and find another speaker right I don't want that person to fail at it and give speaking a bad name like oh we're never giving that again because that was an awful experience I want my competitors or quote unquote, you know, um, you know, people like co- teammates, like to, to do well at they, if we can see it as like, we all come together, we grow demand for that thing that we, um, the industry that we're in, it's all a good thing. Like, what do you think of that, Lois? Well, you know, it, it shifts the whole concept of competition, doesn't it? Because yeah. what we're doing is we're looking at if, the industry is strong, I can be stronger, and there's more business. It is a shift in your mentality from scarcity to abundance. Because when you're building something with that notion, you said there's plenty, there's abundance. And the other thing I think is, when you take time to really appreciate what the other person is good at, and I feel this when I go to trade shows, is sometimes you feel that competition, Ooh, you know what, They've got a much yeah. better exhibit than I do this year. Or, wow, that new idea they brought to market, that was fabulous. Why didn't I have such a good idea, right? So there's yeah. a part of that. But what it also does is it forces me to become better because mm-hmm. I am being stretched good to go to the next level. So part of that discomfort is powerful in terms of putting you in a good direction for where you need to to go. But it's hard sometimes to get there because you have to let go of not enough. I'm Mm -hmm. not enough and move to let me learn. Yes. Yes. And that's why I like just to remind myself like this, it's, it's natural to have some compare and despair. I think people run around and they're like, oh my gosh, but I'm feeling like, it's like, oh, there you are. I was expecting you to show up and tell me I'm not enough. I'm sometimes like, I talk to my brain. I'm like, okay, point noted. I've noted that thought. I'm not going to hold on to it. Let it go. And then I always love to say, I, it's not easy, but I'm practicing the thought of like, I use other people's success as examples of what is possible. Yeah. Like, wow, that is possible to do that. Like what would be my version of that? You know, and that's what I like to um, 
ask myself. So we're again, powerful questions, asking your brain useful questions to solve for, not answering the question of why am I not enough? Why didn't I think of that? What's wrong with me? Not going to find helpful thoughts. Some really helpful thoughts is to remember, like sometimes it's remembering like they're human, just like me. Like let's not put them on a pedestal and suddenly say they're a unicorn. They're human. We have humanness in common. So I love asking, like getting curious, like, I wonder how they did it. Like, what can I learn from? What do you think they were thinking and believing that has helped them create that result? Because remember, what created that result? What created that amazing program with all the bells and whistles of the big, you know, was their belief that drove all of their feelings, which drove all of their actions and their resilience and their commitment to figuring that out to create that thing. What do you think that belief is? Because guess what? That belief is available to you to believe in right now as well. Of like, I'm not going to stop until I figure it out, until I keep learning, until like you've got to have that that growth open mindset um, to really just use other people as examples of what's possible and um, and and realize that like you can't change that at that expo you know what your kind of thing is like but the future redirect to the future that is all your property to create and and believe what you want moving forward so I think if we can just remind ourselves that just because she's successful doesn't mean you're going to be less successful in fact if you're at a trade show if someone's killing it and doing really well it's a great thing for your industry as a whole and another um thing I like to remind myself is just remembering like I'm not entitled to success I haven't yet earned mm. like wow that's I good. remember yeah so this was huge for me when I started my sister's charity I had this goal um, so it was in travel safety and we have the department of foreign affairs here in Australia and the foreign minister I'd always had a joke I'm like I'm going to meet with her like I know that this is going to get on the government's radar it's going to and so after like a year, I sent out this email and I was like, this is what I want to do. And I was like, they're going to get right on board with this. And it was like crickets. So it took over two years of figuring it out. And then actually on the two year anniversary of losing my sister, the government ended up reaching out. And, you know, now I've gotten to the mm-hmm. point where I've been personally invited into her office to meet and they give all this support and everything. But I remember getting a little bit frustrated, like, you know, like this is, and I'm like, hang on, Kate, you're not, you are not entitled. It's, as much as I was so passionate about it, I felt like they should just listen to me. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't understand. You know, like when you believe in something, but it's like, I'm not entitled for them to pay any attention to me. I haven't earned this yet, but day by day, by overcoming all of these things between me and my goal, I will grow into the woman who is worthy of that recognition and that support. So I think um, it's just sometimes we've got to humble ourselves down. You could be comparing yourself to someone who's been working at their craft for 10 years. It's not fair on you to compare yourself to them, but it's also not fair on them and all their work they've put in to then feel upset that you're not at that same place as they are. So I think that's a big reality check that um, we all we all need to remember. And sometimes something I also like to redirect to is just remembering like, yeah, this is, this is harder for me and that's okay. Like it might be harder for me to get the hang of this or to be as natural at speaking on stage as someone else is. That's okay. In fact, the fact I have to work so hard to do well is actually helping me develop skills far more priceless than just the result of being a great speaker. It's making me develop the skill of commitment and grittiness and perseverance and resilience and those skills are actually what's going to take me even further and think of new ideas and all of that stuff like I almost think sometimes it's a shame for people to just instantly be the best at their game if they haven't had to work that that hard for it they're missing out on what I feel like the real prize is so often that comes with success you know, that's so true. And you think about um, work, you think about school. Um, I often think the people who had it easiest are not the ones who become innovators. 
or mm -hmm. are driven with passion for success because they don't they've not learned perseverance so mm -hmm. i think and that's the key skill like it's uh, because they can only go so far until they come up against an event in life which is going to demand them to have to persevere like right now with COVID-19 if no if no one's ever had anything rock the boat they're going to find it a lot challenging right now than someone who's been since they left you know high school kind of always had to work that little bit harder and persevere her and it's taken them the longer path they're like oh no I know how to deal with things not going my way or things being a little bit harder for me and I know how to and they'll actually get through the other side of this um with a lot, lot less drama and meltdowns probably than, you know, the, the, the person who hasn't. And the last thing I just want to offer up as a redirect thought and something to remember when that initial compare and despair comes in is, as I said, it's we attach our worth to our success mm. and that's where we're getting confused. We need to remember our worth is never on the line here because that's what we're saying. When I'm not enough, it's like, I'm not worthy and I'm not good enough, but two entirely separate things. Again, whatever we put our minds, whatever goal we put out there in the world, that is separate to us as human beings. We are human beings, not human doings. Okay. We're not, <laughs> we're not graded on what we're doing in the world, just who we're being, right? Just being present and being, existing in this world is enough. There's, there's never been um, a, a judgment of um, our worth. So just remember her success or his success doesn't make him or her more or less worthy. And the same goes with us. Like our worth just is, we are worthy and there is nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do out there in the world that can make us more valuable or less valuable. Our worth just is. And I'm just always reminding myself of that because that's what makes it so painful and scary for us because we forget to just remind ourselves, hang on a second. My worst not on the line here. I'm still lovable. My family, you know, I still have a family who, who loves me. And, you know, I, I am always reminding myself, it's not like, um, you know, a new baby's born and we look at it and we think, well, once you get to CEO and earn a big house and have a nice car, then we'll love you more. <laughs> like, no, you just love the baby for existing, for being there, for giving you an opportunity to love. And that's how... I think we forget and think so many people like it's like, oh, once I get there, then I'll be worthy of their love. And it's it's not true. Even if people um, are saying that, if you feel like, no, I have to prove my worth, like I just like to remember someone's, how lovable I am is up to someone's capacity to love. It's not mm. up to me. You know, I I love my dog Cooper with all my heart. Like I can't even explain it. Well, my dad isn't such a fan. But does that make Cooper, my dog, less lovable? No, it's on my dad and his capacity to love dogs. <laughs> Cooper just is lovable, 100% lovable, and it's up to me and I am 100% all about the dog. So I feel great love for him. Dad feels differently. It does has nothing to do with Cooper either way. And the same goes with us as humans. And I think that's so important to remember in the face of compare and despair. Our worth just is success is not food. It's not in limited supply. They're an example of what is possible. Step into their shoes, step into their mind, ask themselves, what do you think they're choosing to believe? Because I'm telling you that is ultimately what created that result. Not their smartness, not their abilities, what they, whatever. It's their commitment to, um, to getting it done. And you can borrow that belief now. Beliefs are so strong, aren't they? And if, yes. um, we either limit ourselves or we move ourselves based on our beliefs and it's mm -hmm. our beliefs are impacted by what you talk about with those ants running around in our yeah head. whether you believe and react to them or whether you just recognize reflect and redirect them it's it's a day in day out pra day out practice like it's like simple in theory but i get it's not easy in practice and that's what we need to remember between simple and easy like yeah it's really simple to be like yeah you know Thoughts create feelings, drive actions, create results. Great. But actually putting it into practice, it can be challenging, but that's why, you know, we've done a 10 part series. So I keep getting in your ears and reminding you to keep putting it into the practice. One session in the gym isn't going to change your body. One session of just like one, you know, moment of recognizing and 
reflect re-reflecting, <laughs> redirecting, <laughs> um, doesn't, you know, change your brain, but little by little, consistently, day in, day out, what we do, that creates change. So stick with the process, guys. Stick with it. I love that, Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wisdom tonight. And it's the beliefs. Um, so when things aren't working quite the way that you would like, check out the leaves because boy, they, they hold the key to a lot, don't they? Yes. And the best news is what you believe is up to you. You get to believe whatever you want. There's no, you don't need to seek permission. There's no one that can take that from you. As a 20 year old broken hearted sister, I had no right to believe that one day I'd be standing up next to the prime minister of the, well, actually I haven't met the prime minister as well, but I had no right to believe in that, but no one could take that away from me. I believed in it with all my heart. So every obstacle that came, I found a way to overcome it because I believed in the end result. And that's what you've got to have that undying belief that it will happen. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you for Thank you. this time and our ability to overcome even when we feel a little bit jealous at times when we compare so there's there's light on the other side depending on how we hold it thank you so much and thank you all for listening to building my legacy podcast today and we'll see you on the next podcast again with kate thank you so much thanks kate You've been listening to Building My Legacy Podcast with Dr. Lois Sonstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sonstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.